This is the Music Hall of Fame podcast. This week we discuss the year in music for 1994 along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1994. We also look at the case for putting the Runaways into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Grammy Museum Hall of Fame in Los Angeles, California. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1994. In music, 1994 was marked by the death of Kurt Cobain from Nirvana. 1994 was also the year that Michael Jackson married Lisa Marie Presley, the Eagles got back together and hell froze over, Aerosmith became the first major label band to purposely put a free song onto the internet for downloading, and Lisa Left Eye Lopez burned down her boyfriend's mansion. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, who also knows how to use a flame accelerant. Woodstock 94 happened. The three-day festival was televised on MTV and helped to put artists Nine Inch Nails, Green Day, Sheryl Crow, and Melissa Etheridge's careers into overdrive. Bill Wyman left the Rolling Stones. Pink Floyd went on tour for the final time. Pearl Jam went to war with Ticketmaster. Michael Bolton was found guilty of copyright infringement after the court found that his song Love is a Beautiful Thing was a little too close to the Isley Brothers song of the same name. Brian Adams became the first Western music artist since the end of the Vietnam War to hold a concert in that country. The United States Supreme Court ruled that parodying songs was allowed under the Fair Use Law. The ruling had to do with the two live crews' use of Roy Orbison's song, Oh Pretty Woman, without getting permission first. The biggest selling song of 1994 was Ace of Bass's The Sign. In fact, it was the year of Ace of Bass, as the group had three of the top ten biggest selling singles, with the other two songs being All That She Wants and Don't Turn Around. Other hits from 1994 included I Swear by All for One, I'll Make Love to You by Boys to Men, The Power of Love by Celine Dion, Hero by Mariah Carey, Stay by Lisa Loeb, and Breathe Again by Tony Braxton. Despite the success of Ace of Bass's album The Sign, the biggest selling album of the year was actually the Lion King soundtrack. 1994 was also the year where a lot of breakthrough and landmark albums were released. Alice in Chains released their EP, Jar of Flies, which became the first EP to hit number one on the Billboard Top 200 Albums chart. Green Day released their album, Dookie. Nine Inch Nails released their album, The Downward Spiral. The Offspring released their album, Smash, which became the biggest selling independent album of all time. Weezer released their debut album. Oasis released their debut album, Definitely Maybe. The Arctic Monkeys released their debut album, and Jeff Buckley released his groundbreaking album, Grace. Tim McGraw, Boys to Men, Counting Crows, Stone Temple Pilots, Kenny G, and Mariah Carey also had big selling albums in 1994. In country music, the biggest albums included John Michael Montgomery's Kicking It Up, Garth Brooks's The Hits, George Strait's Lead On, Tim McGraw's Not a Moment Too Soon, Mary Chapin Carpenter's Stories in the Road, Brooks and Dunn's Waiting on Sundown, and the big country singles included John Michael Montgomery's I Swear and also his song Be My Baby Tonight, George Strait's The Big One, Tim McGraw's Don't Take the Girl, Clay Walker's Dreaming With My Eyes Open, Travis Tritt's Foolish Pride, Clint Black's A Good Run of Bad Luck, Mark Chestnut's I Just Wanted to You to Know, and Shenandoah's If Bubba Can Dance, I Can Too. In hip-hop, there were classic albums like Notorious B.I.G.'s Ready to Die, Nas's Illmatic, J. Rude, The Damages, The Sun Rises in the East, Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth's The Main Ingredient, Organized Confusion Stress The Extinction Agenda, Snoop Dogg's Murder Was the Case, Warren G.'s Regulate G-Funk Era, 
Method Man's Tykel, Bone Thugs and Harmony's Creepin' on a Come Up, Gang Stars, Hard to Earn, Diggable Planet's Blowout Comb, Scarface's The Diary, Grave Digger's Six Feet Deep, and Outcast's Southern Playlist, Cadillac Music. Some of the popular hip-hop songs were Warren G's Regulate, Coolio's Fantastic Voyage, Heavy D's Nothing But Love, and also Got Me Waiting, Salt and Peppa and N. Vogue's What a Man, Snoop Dogg's Gin and Juice, and also Who Am I, Craig Max's Flavor in Your Ear, Tupac's Keep Your Head Up, Bone Thugs and Harmony's Thuggish Ruggish Bone, and the notorious B.I.G.'s Juicy. It was all a dream. In dance music, DJ Paul Oakenfold broadcasted his first legendary Goa mix. Mix Mag started a trend when they anointed Sasha as the first superstar DJ. The label would be applied to a number of festival headlining DJs after that. The record label Metalhead, started by DJs Chemistry, Storm, and Goldie, helped to put drum and bass onto the genre map. Orbital performed a legendary performance at the Glastonbury Music Festival, which helped to bring EDM to a more mainstream audience. Great Britain passed the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act, which tried to punish rave culture. Ravers responded, of course, by protesting and raving, although they did have one sanctioned rave at Wembley Stadium that drew 10,000 people. Cafe Mambo and the Cream Parties also started in Ibiza in that year. Some of the big dance albums that were popular in 1994 included Massive Attack's Protection, Portishead's Dummy, The Prodigy's Music for the Jilted Generation, which had the hit songs Voodoo People and No Good, and Paul Van Dyke's 45 RPM, which had the influential song Foreign Angel. Other classic dance tracks that were big that year included Livin' Joy's Dreamer, Reel to Reel's I Like to Move It, Move It, 20 Fingers Short Short Man, which is also called something else, which I'm not going to repeat here, Two Unlimited's Let the Beat Control Your Body, Real McCoy's Runaway and Another Night, M People's Moving On Up, Crystal Waters 100% Pure Love, General Public's I'll Take You There, and Gloria Stefan's Turn the Beat Around, and if you think Eurodance was big in that era, you're not kidding. In Latin music, the biggest artists included Gloria Stefan, Luis Miguel, The Gypsy Kings, Selena, Mania, Bronco, Marco Antonio Solis, and Los Bucas, La Mafia, Ana Gabriel, and John Cicada. Musicals and revivals of musicals that opened on Broadway included Beauty and the Beast, Carousel, Damn Yankees, Grease, Showboat, and Sunset Boulevard. Musical movies that came out in 1994 included Airheads, Backbeat, Fear of a Black Hat, Immortal Beloved, Hated, G.G. Allen, and the Murder Junkies, The Lion King, The Swan Princess, and Thumbelina. Bands who got together in 1994 included 20 Fingers, Basement Jacks, La Bouche, Bowling for Soup, The Derek Trucks Band, Disturbed, Death in Vegas, The Foo Fighters, The Fugees, Gravity Kills, Hoobastank, Method Man and Red Man, The Locks, Limp Biscuit, Lucid Nation, Lunatic, Pendulum, Muse, Seven Dust, Sasha and John Digweed, Scarfo, The Rasmus, Republica, Rednecks, Orgy, Orbit, Orange 9mm, Space Hog, The Spice Girls, Sneaker Pimps, Sunvolt, Skunk Anansi, Storyville, System of a Down, Static X, Total, and Tenacious D. Groups who either broke up until, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced a hiatus included Acid Test, Bob's Your Uncle, Nirvana, chiefly because of Kurt Cobain's death, High Five, School of Fish, The Staple Singers, Los Bucas, Jellyfish, Con Can, Level 42, Leaders of the New School, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, Dramarama, Main Source, Uncle Tupelo, White Snake, Winger, The Wonder Stuff, New Kids on the Block, Five Blind Boys of Mississippi, and Firehose. Groups who got back together in 1994 included The Circle Jerks, King Crimson, and Hell Froze Over and got the Eagles back together. Artists who were born in 1994 included Justin Bieber, Harry Styles, Bad Bunny, 
Maluma, Ashton Irwin of Five Seconds of Summer, Howard Lawrence of Disclosure, DJ Nathan Daw, DJ Madeon, Phoebe Bridgers, Caliuchis, Christina Grimmy, Ava Max, Kai of EXO, RM and J Hope of BTS, Lynn Gunn of Paris, Halsey, rappers King Von, Dax, Dreezy, and Lil Baby. Artists who passed away, aside from the aforementioned Kurt Cobain, included singer songwriter Harry Nilsson, composer Henry Mancini, songwriter Jules Stein, entertainers Donald Swan of Flanders and Swan, Martha Ray, and Dinah Shore, guitarist Fred Sonic Smith of MC5, bassist Kristen Flaff of Hole, singers Ephraim Lewis, Garnett Silk, and Dan Hartman. Jazz guitarists Eric Gale and Joe Pass, and jazz singers Carmen McRae and Cab Calloway. In awards for the music of 1994, at the Grammy Awards, Sheryl Crow won Best New Artist and Record of the Year for All I Want to Do, while Bruce Springsteen won Song of the Year for Streets of Philadelphia. Tony Bennett's MTV Unplug won Best Album. At the American Music Awards, Michael Bolton, Mariah Carey, Asa Bass, and the Lion King soundtrack were the big winners. At the Billboard Music Awards, Asa Bass won Artist of the Year. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Video of the Year went to Aerosmith for the song Cryin'. Queen Latifah won Entertainer of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. Reba McIntyre, Aerosmith, and Garth Brooks won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Dublin, Ireland, the country of Ireland won on home turf for the song Rock and Roll Kids. Vince Gill won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and Reba McIntyre won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Blur won Best British Album for Park Life, and they also won Best Song for Park Life at the Brit Awards. Celine Dion won Best Album for Color of My Love, while Jan Arden won Best Song for Could I Be Your Girl at the Juno Awards. Tina Arena won Album of the Year for Don't Ask, and Silverchair won Single of the Year for Tomorrow at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, Passion won Best Musical. 1994 was the first time that the Tonys gave out an award for Best Revival of a Musical, which was won in 1994 by Carousel. Before then, plays and musicals went up for the same category called Best Revival. The Pulitzer Prize for music was won by Gunther Schuller for Of Reminiscences and Reflections, Aaron J. Kernis for Still Movement with Him, and Charles Warrenen for Micro Symphony. Musically at the Academy Awards, the movie The Lion King won both music categories with Elton John and Tim Rice's Can You Feel the Love Tonight winning Best Song and Hans Zimmer winning Best Original Score. M People won the Mercury Music Prize for the album Elegant Slumming. The 1994 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on January 19th at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. At the ceremony, Bono gave one of the best induction speeches ever for inductee Bob Marley. Paul McCartney hugged Yoko Ono during John Lennon's induction. There was supposed to be a reunion of the group The Band, but some feuds continue to run deep, and the one between band members Robbie Robertson and Levon Helm ran rivers deep at that point. They eventually reconciled a decade later, but that was after 35 years of really not talking to each other. During the rest of the ceremony, band leader, talent scout, and record producer Johnny Otis was inducted into the non-performers category. Willie Dixon was inducted into the early influencers category. And in the performers category, the hall inducted the animals, the band, the Grateful Dead, Sir Roderick Stewart, John Lennon, Sir Elton John, Bob Marley, and this next artist. Dwayne Eddy wasn't your typical rock and roll star. In an era that was dominated by singers and crooners, Eddy carved his niche in instrumental rock with his electric guitar. 
His signature sound, the twang, a reverberating bass-heavy melody, became synonymous with rebellion and coolness in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Born in Corning, New York on April 26, 1938, Eddie's musical journey began actually in 1943 at the age of five when he watched cowboy crooner Gene Autry singing. This early exposure to country music instilled in him a love for the guitar, which he picked up shortly thereafter. Eddie's early influences were a blend of country and rockabilly. Chet Atkins, a legendary fingerstyle guitarist, provided a foundation for Eddie's technical prowess. He also drew inspiration from rockabilly pioneers like Carl Perkins and Scotty Moore, whose electrifying sounds were redefining popular music at that time. In 1951, the Eddie family relocated to Arizona, where the young guitarist honed his skills in local bands. Arizona also introduced him to the music scene, where he started his career by forming the duo Jimmy and Dwayne with his friend Jimmy Dell. Arizona was also where he met eventual producer Lee Hazelwood, a future collaborator who would play a pivotal role in shaping Eddie's sound. Lee started producing Jimmy and Dwayne's music until the duo broke up and Dwayne started doing solo work. The chance meeting between Eddie and Lee Hazelwood in Phoenix, Arizona at a television station where Dwayne had a weekly performance slot proved to be a turning point in Dwayne's career. Hazelwood, a DJ-turned-songwriter-producer, recognized Eddie's talent and envisioned a unique sound that would set him apart from everybody else. Experimenting in the studio, they arrived at the now-iconic twang. This sound, achieved through a combination of factors, became Dwayne's signature sound. Dwayne often used only the bottom three strings of his guitar, creating a thicker, bassier sound. He employed heavy reverb and echo techniques pioneered by Hazelwood, which gave his guitar a haunting, almost otherworldly presence. Eddie's picking style, influenced by Chet Atkins, was clean and precise, allowing the melody to shine through all the effects that he was putting on it. And the final touch was the inclusion of Steve Douglas's honking saxophone on many of his early recordings, adding a layer of rawness and excitement. Steve eventually became part of the famous Wrecking Crew session musician team. The twang wasn't just a sonic innovation. It embodied a certain attitude at the time. It kept the rebellious nature of rock and roll going at a time in the late 1950s when mainstream America tried to water it down, since it had still been considered the N-word music back then, as the racists literally called it, because it was originally black music that a few white artists like Elvis, Bill Haley, and Buddy Holly made popular with kids and thus was considered very dangerous music to the kids much like how rap music was considered dangerous from the 1970s through the early 2000s, we'd say. The release of the song Rebel Rouser in 1958 marked Eddie's arrival. The song, with its driving rhythm and Dwayne's guitar work, became an instant hit, reaching number six on the Billboard charts. A string of successful instrumentals followed, including Peter Gunn, the Henry Mancini-written theme song for the popular detective series, and also was used in a bunch of movies like the Blues Brothers. Also, the song Cannonball and the song Because They're Young. Eddie wasn't just topping the charts, he was influencing a whole new generation of musicians. The impact of Dwayne Eddy's music transcended genres. The Shadows, the British instrumental rock band who were Cliff Richard's backup band and who were big before the Beatles took over, credited Dwayne as a major inspiration. Their clean, reverb-laden sound owed a significant debt to Dwayne's pioneering work at the time. A young George Harrison of the Beatles was captivated by Eddie's twang, incorporating elements of it into his early guitar playing. Even rockers like Bruce Springsteen and Steve Earle acknowledged Dwayne's influence, recognizing the power and emotion that could be conveyed through an instrumental guitar. 
While the early 1960s saw a decline in Duane's chart dominance with the rise of vocal-driven music like the British Invasion, his influence continued to grow. He continued to tour and record, collaborating with artists like the Beach Boys and Phil Spector. Duane also embraced new musical trends, incorporating elements of surf rock and psychedelia into his sound. Even though his heyday was the late 1950s into the 1960s, Duane continued to collaborate and perform. He did a small tour in the United Kingdom in 2018 to mark his 80th birthday. On April 26, 2024, Duane celebrated his 86th birthday. Four days later, on April 30th, 2024, Dwayne Eddy passed away from cancer at the age of 86. During his career, Dwayne Eddy released 23 studio albums and 12 compilation albums. Of those, four hit the top 40 in America, with two of those four going top 10. In the United Kingdom, nine hit the top 40, with five of those nine going into the top 10. He also released 57 singles. Of those, 16 hit the top 40 in America, with three of those 16 going top 10. In the UK, 21 hit the top 40, with nine of those 21 hitting the top 10. Dwayne Eddy was nominated for two Grammy Awards, winning one. He won Guitar Player Magazine's Legend Award in 2004 and was voted the number one world musical personality in NME Magazine in 1960, over Elvis Presley, no less. Eddie was also the first rock and roll guitarist to get his own signature guitar, which was the Dwayne Eddy DE400 and also the DE500. Later in his career, Gretsch started coming out with Dwayne Eddy signature series as well, at least four different versions to be precise. His favorite guitar, though, was a 1957 Chet Atkins Gretsch 6120 that he traded in a Gibson Les Paul standard for when he was in Phoenix in 1957. Dwayne Eddy redefined the role of the electric guitar, proving that it could be a powerful and expressive solo instrument. His signature twang became a sonic touchstone, inspiring countless musicians across countless genres. Presented for induction by Mick Jones of 2024 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, Foreigner, the king of twang guitar, Dwayne Eddy inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1994, and we have put a selection of his music onto this week's podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This week, we're going to make the case for putting the Los Angeles band The Runaways into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. To the tale of the tape we go. The Runaways released four studio albums, three live albums, and nine compilation albums. Of those, none of them hit the top 100 in America, although two of them went top 40 in Australia and two in Sweden. They also released three singles. Of those... 1976's Cherry Bomb hit number 6 in America, and 1977's Heartbeat went to number 10. All right, so they weren't exactly commercial hard rock beasts. However, the Runaways were one of the first all-female hard rock bands in an extremely male music industry that wanted their girl groups to be dainty and in skirts all the time. The Runaways weren't having that. Blue jeans, leather, in-your-face attitude. That is the way these ladies played. 
as far as who they influenced. How about every hard rocking female band and performer out there today? Pat Benatar, the Go-Go's, Vixen, Hole, the Bangles, who actually had former Runaways bassist Mickey Steele, L7, the Donnas, the list goes on and on and on. If they're an all-female band, then they were more than likely influenced by the Runaways. Now, I know that Joan Jett is in the hall with her band, the Blackhearts, but It is high time for her, Sandy West, Mickey Steele, Lita Ford, Sherry Curry, Peggy Foster, Jackie Fox, Vicki Blue, and Lori McAllister to finally get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame together. Because simply put, how the hell is this group not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yet? And just to prove it, we have also put their music onto this week's podcast playlist. The link, like I said before, is in the show notes. This week's Spotlight Music Hall of Fame is the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles, California. There are actually three Grammy museums now, with one in Newark, New Jersey, and the other in Cleveland, Mississippi, to go with the main one in Los Angeles. The Recording Academy runs the museums, but has been inducting members into its Hall of Fame since 1974. The main Grammy Museum itself, with its Hall of Fame wing, opened in 2008 at LA Live, which is the downtown LA complex that has the former Staples Center name to it, now actually called the Crypto.com Arena, because boy does that roll off the tongue. In any event, the museum has four floors, including a theater called the Clive Davis Theater after the famed record executive and music guru. Some of the past exhibits there have paid tribute to John Lennon, Roy Orbison, Shakira, and the world of hip hop. Plus, they have ticketed evening discussions with artists such as Debbie Gibson, Madison Beer, and Lil Nas X. Ticket prices are normally $18 for adults, $15 for seniors and military members with ID, and $12 for college students with ID and kids 5 through 17. Children 4 and under and museum members are free. Its normal hours are Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and closed on Tuesdays. GrammyMuseum.org is its website, which you should check for hours that may or may not change, depending on if they have events going, along with updated ticket prices, because those definitely do change. Mary Isabel Catherine Bernadette O'Brien was born in Essex, Middlesex, England. You know her better as Dusty Springfield. Her career started in the late 1950s as a member of the Lana Sisters and the Springfields, with the Springfields having the hit Islands of Dreams, Say I Won't Be There, and Silver Threads and Golden Needles. She went solo in 1963 and had hits right off the bat with I Only Want to Be With You, Stay a While, All I See Is You, I'll Try Anything, Wishing and Hoping, and You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. Dusty developed a fashion style that included ultra-blonde bouffant hair, heavy makeup, and flowing evening gowns. She also developed a love of American R&B and soul music. She showcased a lot of it when she hosted the TV series Dusty in England. Between 1966 and 1969, in fact, she hosted five TV shows in England. In 1968, Dusty was at a crossroads in her career. For starters, the musical tastes of the general public began to change. Also, her relationships with the people whom she had relied on to write songs for her began to change, and hits were becoming hard to come by all of a sudden. Dusty decided to go all in with her love of American soul music. She signed a record deal with Atlantic Records, mainly due to the fact that her idol, Aretha Franklin, was on the label, but also because she wanted to work with producer and record label co-owner Jerry Wexler. Jerry gave Dusty a bunch of song demos to try 
and out of all of them, they narrowed down the number to 11. The songwriters were powerhouse names, Carole King and Jerry Goffin, Randy Newman, Burke Bacharach, Hal David, and Barry Mann and Cynthia Wheel. According to Wexler's book, Dusty had to be talked into recording the songs because she initially hated all of them. Dusty sort of backed that up, though she said that she did like Son of a Preacher Man and also Just a Little Lovin'. The tracks that were on the original release were Just a Little Lovin', So Much Love, Son of a Preacher Man, I Don't Want to Hear It Anymore, Don't Forget About Me, Breakfast in Bed, Just One Smile, The Windmills of Your Mind, In the Land of Make Believe, No Easy Way Down, and I Can't Make It Alone. Subsequent CD reissues have added a bunch of bonus tracks to those. Next, she went to American Sound Studio in Memphis, Tennessee in September of 1968 and started working with the famed studio musicians, the Memphis Boys, along with backup studio singing group Sweet Inspirations. Arif Martin helped to produce the sessions with Tom Dowd, Ed Colas, and Terry Manning engineering them. Gene Orloff did the orchestral arrangements. There was just one slight little problem when she got there. Dusty felt so awestruck with working with her idols that she couldn't really sing the way that she wanted to. She felt completely inferior, so much so that she ended up re-recording all her vocals at Atlantic Studios in New York City. Fun little side note to the Memphis Sessions that marginally has something to do with her. During a visit by the Atlantic record heads, she talked them into signing an unknown group at the time because the group's bass player was a friend who had backed her up while she was on tour a couple times. Based on Dusty's advice, Atlantic signed the group. The bassist who was her friend was John Paul Jones. The group was Led Zeppelin. The album Dusty in Springfield was released by Atlantic Records on March 31, 1969 in America. Phillips Records did the international release and put that one out on April 18th in the UK. The album actually sold pretty poorly at first. In fact, it only got as high as number 99 on the Billboard Hot Albums chart. It did, however, manage to have one hit on it, the now classic Son of a Preacher Man. Critically, though, the album was greeted with applause and was even nominated for a Grammy Award. It has since taken on almost mythic proportions and has landed on many greatest of all time lists and in an awful lot of music halls of fame. As far as Dusty went, her career in the 1970s was kind of interesting. She sang backup on songs for her friends like Elton John. That's her vocals, actually, on the song The Bitch is Back for Elton. She also put out a few more albums that didn't all actually do all that well. Her personal life became fodder for the British tabloids as she was a member of the LGBTQ community, so she ended up uh, moving to America to get away from it all. Who knew that America would actually be better on that than Great Britain? But hmm. Her career received a bounce in 1987 when Neil Tennant of the Pet Shop Boys came calling. He wanted her to sing on their new single, What Have I Done to Deserve This?, Dusty accepted, and the song became a huge hit, landing at number two in both America and in Great Britain. At last, the public refound Dusty, and at this point, Dusty and Memphis found a new audience, and the stature of the album began to grow again. However, two weeks before she was supposed to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999, Dusty passed away at the age of 59 from breast cancer, ending a great career that should have been so much more. Dusty Springfield actually had 21 studio albums. Of those, two hit the top 10 in the UK, while the highest any of them got in America was 1964's Stay a While, I Only Want to Be With You, which hit number 62. 
She also put out 69 singles. Of those, 12 hit the top 10 in the UK, while four hit the top 10 in America. She has been placed on numerous greatest female singers of all time lists, including Q Magazine, Mojo Magazine, VH1, and Rolling Stone Magazine. Rolling Stone also named Dusty and Memphis as one of the greatest albums of all time, while it was also inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame and also the United States Library of Congress National Recording Registry, which is a high honor indeed. Dusty Springfield's iconic album, Dusty in Memphis, inducted into the Grammy Museum Hall of Fame in Los Angeles, California in 2001. And we have put that album, along with a few other Dusty songs, because she's that good, onto this week's music podcast playlist. Like I said before, the link is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>